Hey everybody, do we have, um, have a good lunch so far? Yeah? Awesome. So, I am Mike Prasad, I'm the founder of Tiny Sponsor, and I'm here to moderate. We have a really awesome panel on sponsorship and how to make money uh, through brand sponsorships. And before I um, get into the heavy questions, I actually want to give everyone on the panel a chance to introduce themselves. We have a really broad panel, I think, approaching the perspective, uh, approaching from different perspectives from a content creator, from agency side, from a business, um, from the PR side. So I'm going to let everyone do a quick intro to who they are, what they do, um, and how that, what aspect of monetization that you've either handled or you've succeeded at. Um, we can start with at the very end, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Marie. Um, I work on the agency side, so brands hire myself and my team to um, kind of execute influencer campaigns from top to bottom from developing an influencer marketing strategy for them, um, the right influencers to promote their brands that have um, the right audience that they're trying to reach as a brand to actually make money. Um, negotiating with influencers or usually more nowadays their agents um, and making sure everything goes live as was agreed upon in the contract that we write um, and of course following up and trying to turn these um, paid sponsorships into long-term partnerships because it's more beneficial for uh, both influencer and the brand which I'm sure we'll get into. <laughs> All right, so I come from both sides. Um, I started as an, uh, as an influencer, I started a YouTube channel when I was in business school um, that was one of the first um, fitness, really popular fitness channels um, that ended up becoming my full-time job and I built one of the first subscription models in fitness, um, which I now sold as of um, February um, of this year to, um, to a private equity firm and I'm now in-house as their chief marketing officer um, with a variety of brands underneath us, one of them being um, a fitness brand, a legacy fitness brand that's been around from the 80s. And I'm restructuring the launch of a brand to market that's been a traditional brand, product, service, brick and mortar, uh, stores and chains, that now we have flipped the business model on its head and are becoming digital first, using social media, digital media, great online video content and influencer marketing. Um, the other side of that is I became very passionate when I was building my career about um, influencer marketing, not calling it that at the time, uh, but that's exactly what it was. I, I called it you know, brandscaping or working with collaborating with others. I think that's the way to go big if you want to go big long term. Um, and I uh, started, I created the first influencer marketing course at UCLA. Um, and now it has become a book deal with our first book, my first, first book coming out uh, next fall. And through this, we are creating an entire hub for influencer marketing, which will have curriculum, it'll have resources, it'll have speakers, experts in the field, top influencers that are actually really good to work with, which, as I'm sure you can attest, sometimes uh, it's hit or miss on, on being able to actually execute business strategy. So in a nutshell, long-winded story, that's my I do. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Zedekiah, and um, so I am not on the brand side of things. I'm on the influencer side. I'm an actor and an influencer. Um, I have a YouTube channel, um, and with that, um, I had representation um, through, uh, um, uh, through Full Screen, um, which is a company that represents uh, influencers. And through that company, I got a lot of sponsorships and brand deals. Um, even though I'm such a small influencer, small influencers do have a large impact um, depending on their content, uh, what they choose to create, and um, what they have to say. Um, I think that um, it's important to know um, you're about sponsorships as a small influencer because you are developing yourself, you're becoming something bigger, so you want to make sure that you're aware of situations where you might be getting screwed, which happens more often than not, um, and you just want to be in the know, and so um, I hopefully can help on this panel show you guys some of that and uncover some sad realities. <laughs> I'm Megan. Um, I work with 
tiny sponsor currently, um, but in the past I've worked for an agency and an MCN. I worked for a platform, Flipagram, for a little while. Um, so my background is pretty diverse, mostly on the brand side, but what really my favorite thing and the common thread through all of those roles was that I love getting the chance to take care of influencers and help creative people make money doing what they love and dealing with all the logistics and the number side of everything on their behalf. Hi, I'm Zach James. I'm an old school YouTuber from like back 2009. Got 70 million video views, a couple hundred thousand followers. I'm like, this is cool, but I don't want to be a personality forever. So I looked around my industry, realized there's a lot of talented YouTube animators and voice actors, and I banded them together to create a digital animation studio that has generated over two and a half billion video views. And I've been across the industry in a few different ways, uh, and I take a lot of experiences and skills, and I applied it to the animation side, and I actually get people to sponsor our cartoons. And we work with budgets as little as, you know, a couple grand to as big as a quarter million dollars. Uh, Facebook is one of my biggest sponsors right now. Uh, we work with a lot of mobile companies. We do a diligent job of recognizing and identifying our audience behavior patterns and finding what complements them in terms of brands. You know, if someone likes a cartoon, maybe they might, might like a video game. If they're on the phone all the time, maybe an app might be a great way to uh, get a sponsorship. So, yeah, I'm just a chill, laid-back guy who somehow gets money. <laughs> the dream. The dream. Sounds so easy. <laughs> so, Zedekiah, you touched upon this really interestingly about there's a lot of negatives and a lot of mistakes. Um, anyone, question for the whole panel. What are some common pitfalls and or myths in what we call influencer marketing, which is really content marketing, and it's a little bit broader than that. We'll get into that later. But myths and pitfalls that you've heard that are just mistakes that people make? Well, I think for, if you're an influencer, you think as soon as you get a certain number of followers or start making a certain amount of money that your life is just gonna be super glamorous, traveling and eating out every second. And of course, it is a lot of hard work that goes into getting deals that big. I worked for Hyatt, um, the entire Hyatt portfolio for two years, everything from um, the luxurious Park Hyatt to the, the little Hyatt house. Um, and it's, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, there's a lot of time where you're work, like filming, um, a lot of, you have to get up really early because there's people at the most photogenic places and it's too crowded to take a good photo. Um, so I think the misconception for influencer is that it's just a super easy, like, permanent vacation lifestyle. I think for brands, they have the exact same misconception. Brands are just like, we're paying for this person to take a photo or go eat a meal or go on a trip and they want how much money? And that's, it's the exact same misconception. There is a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and I think... If it's hard for influencers and brands to work together in that sense because they're not always at the same location. I know every time I've been actually on set with an influencer doing the work, um, I'm absolutely amazed. And I think if any if any CEO of any major company actually like accompanied someone on a trip when they were producing content for their brands, they would never second guess it again, but unfortunately that's just not how it works usually. Um, so they, they think that there's not as much work going into it that there actually is, um, and a lot of hours and like blood, sweat, and tears. So I think that's the misconception on both ends, probably. That's just a post, it's not like, it's, there's so much outside the post. Yeah. It's so much. It's, it, it's, it's almost exhausting. Um, no offense to any brand representatives here, I know there's a lot of you, and you guys are great, thank you for what you do. But everyone has to realize that it's so much effort to spend days and, and weeks putting, I mean, editing videos together. There are companies that have reached out to me and they expect me to do it for nothing. And it's exhausting to hear that because it's, it takes away from the time you're spending creating your original content. And you want to keep up your original content because that's what got you here. That is what made you an influencer and you don't want to lose that. So brands need to make sure that they're always recognizing that the influencer has something beautiful and if the influencer loses that, then it's not going to do anything for the brand. The brand won't, 
succeed being sponsored with that influencer just because the influencer doesn't have their original content anymore and nobody's going to watch it. So well, yes, I, think to, oh, go ahead. I think to take both of what you said and almost take a step back, I think the big misconception is that influencer marketing is not the same as influencer advertising and the two are constantly confused and it gives influencer marketing a bad rep. Influencer advertising is paying to post and that is very different and that's a completely different lens through which we look at things. Um, influencer marketing is a much bigger long term, you almost, it's a business investment and it needs to be looked at that way and it needs to be part of your business plan and we need to start by thinking what's the end goal and then work backwards and what is our business strategy, what is our marketing plan and then how, what are the tactics we're going to use. Influencers and social media are not business strategies. They are tactics to execute the end goal. How is that going to fit in? And the other big misconception is that social media, social media people with followings online are influencers. There is zero correlation to having followers and having influence. That's, it could be popularity, they could be fake, but popularity and influence is not the same thing. And you can't tell me that if Warren Buffett told you to buy a stock tomorrow, you wouldn't buy it because he's not an influencer because he's not on social media. There are influencers, that, that the pure definition of influence is to be able to impact or change desired behavior. Social media is just another outlet. It's the internet of, of things. So when brands are selecting an influencer, just looking at a following is so, so surface level. And we're in 2018 now, we need to start looking much deeper beyond that. But he's right, and she's right, that now uh, when we hire somebody that does quote unquote have influence, they are creators. They're in place of a production company, in place of an advertising agency, a photographer. Think about what your budget would be for that, and you're getting all of that with the influencer plus the target audience you're trying to reach. And that's a really good point. It's integrated, right? So on the marketing side, it's not just social. It, it, it follows through with your website. It follows through with your messaging, your content, your values, your branding. Um, on the production side, it's all of those things. And you're also getting creative direction from someone who's outside of your brand who might have a bigger vision or a better vision for an audience that they're more in touch with. And I think what um, uh, Zedekiah, you also mentioned was that, you know, it's a lot of work. And so even if it's just a post, to make that post convert and have value, it goes into what you've created over a period of time. Well, exactly. Um, so, I mean, a lot of brands will just reach out to you and almost um, command uh, certain posts and it's it's hard as an influencer to because as, she's totally right an influencer is somebody that has influence that isn't just numbers or, or popularity but somebody that can urge people to be influenced by something and so when you are working with a brand you want to make sure the content you create uh, for instance I worked with Microsoft about a year back um, on a product called the HoloLens which was this new device um, an augmented, augmented reality device and we put holograms in reality. It was super cool and the agreement I had with them was to post every three weeks a video that I had to create with holograms. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has ever used a HoloLens. It is so hard to use. <laughs> it, I got one yes right here. It's a fantastic device. It is super cool, revolutionary, but the issue is that it takes a while to use it. And so it, it was okay though because th what I was getting in return for that creative process of every three weeks having to submit that video was a lot and it was helping me and it was a great learning experience. So I'm not mad, but I'm just saying brands always need to consider how much they're putting on their, their clients, who they're representing. And they also, um, it, it just, you as a creator need to keep your content original. You need to keep your content yours. Um, I hate when I'm watching a YouTube video and there's somebody speaking uh, about a product that they, you totally know they don't like it. They're, they're talking and they're like, oh, and um, this, is, this is this new product, makeup, and it works great. And they're probably not even wearing it. They've probably never worn it and they probably hate it. And you can tell by, by how they're speaking about the product. And that to me is one of the worst ways a uh, brand and an influencer can work together. So to highlight something that you just mentioned and also Amanda, you made a good point, is that context matters. Um, it's not just advertising, it's not just a post, it's actually built up 
value in the influencer's expertise and the, what they do as an influencer. Um, when you're looking at trying to work with, I think, Zedekiah, for you with your brand deals that you've done before and for, Mana, for you as a business, when you're looking at making that effective, are there certain types of posts that you gravitate towards or are there certain ways to approach it that you gravitate towards in terms of matching up the need of the brand or your product or your advertiser with the nature of the context of your content? Um, I would say it definitely does depend on what the goal is. So, like, for example, if you just want awareness, which are my favorite campaigns because they're the easiest, um, then you just maybe you put posts up on Instagram. People with big impressions are really, you know, a lot easier to access than people who necessarily are going to make a sale. Like she was saying, influence is not necessarily having a lot of followers. But if you just want people to be aware of your brand, things like YouTube are great. Find one big YouTuber and have them post about the brand and then everyone who sees that video is thinking about it. Um, but on the other hand, if you're trying to sell something or you want someone to download an app, then you definitely are wanting you know, a much more engaged audience of people who are more specifically interested in that type of thing. So things like you know, a micro-influencer on Instagram who can do a swipe up link or something like that is a lot more effective. Zach, you actually, your channel does both very well. You guys do animated cartoons. They're very entertaining and they have really broad reach. But I've also seen results from campaigns where you've driven cost per installs below any kind of paid marketing can achieve. How do you actually make that work? Because you're not just saying download the app, you're actually integrating it in a more detailed manner that gets more engagement. So tell us about that. Yeah, so we actually, um, we experimented a lot. We had some early sponsors that would have intellectual properties that we would integrate into the animations and do animation for. We found that wasn't nearly as effective as simply creating an advert. Our audience was so in tune with the cartoon character that spoke People believe this guy telling you mama jokes is a real person. No, he's a cartoon, but they treat him like a real person. They love him, they, they, they quote him, they follow him, they ask him for advice. Sometimes they think I am that cartoon. Uh, so by having this personality, talking to the audience and saying like, check out this awesome game. And yeah, we go down the talking points. We're kind of given a script and we're a little bit more formulaic in the way that we pump out sponsorships than most content creators do. We don't really do a tremendous amount of integration, but the type of integrations that work well for us is almost more of a reverse integration. Um, example, Quid is uh, digital asset stickers. Um, really awesome app, recently raised about $13 million to expand their technology, and we have stickers on this app. And what it is is that there's a limited number of stickers, let's say only a million, and each sticker has a unique number. Lower the, lower the number, the higher the value. And because we have stickers on this app, people flock to this app to get our stickers, but then people that were already on the app that saw our stickers flock back to us. And so it was a really healthy integration. And so because we work with a lot of games, a lot of mobile companies, we always find ways that we can take our assets, give it to them, and have them integrate it into their app, into their uh, game, and so that we create a greater reach towards like, hey, this is our brand just being expanded upon versus, hey, this is a brand that we're trying to promote. So your ideal situation is an integrated dual collaboration? Yes. You've also done stuff where you've taken, so maybe in a scenario where the brand can't integrate your content into their formats, you've done the opposite, where you've integrated their content into your format. So I've seen some gaming videos um, for some mobile games that you've done that. And you've actually created, you, you've maintained your comedy, but very much around their game experience. Yes, we actually did a multi-video campaign last year with Fortnite, and we use uh, Adobe technology called Character Animator to do real-time animation as our cartoon character was playing a video game on live stream. And that drove I think 150,000 installs. Wow. It was a lot. It was a tremendous amount. And people were like, wow, this cartoon character is real. He's talking. He's playing this game. I want to go play it now, too. So what you're thinking about that is the depth of integration you're doing. It's like you're not just saying, hey, download this ad, but you're actually leveraging what makes you unique as a creator and your IP with their IP and combining some hybrid. And I think it's easier for us to do that because, again, I separate myself from the product. 
I wanted the product to stand on its own without my face, without my voice. And because of that, there's a lot less stress when it comes to integrating that because I don't feel like I'm compromising myself. I don't feel like I need to mold myself into something. I already got a cartoon that does that for me. And maybe I can use this character to represent this brand or use that character to represent a different brand. And if I don't have a voice that best represents that brand, we take a step back and we ask ourselves, can we create a character that could fit well into our series long term, but also align with these type of brands so that we can really reach the audience they want to reach? So when you don't have a, so you have the event of a fictional character, which is great. For everyone else, you guys are dealing with real people with real followings, with real established histories. So can you give me some examples of some integrations that you've done either as a creator or as a brand or as an agency that has been really successful for you? And tell me what that integration was and why you think it worked. Um, I can give you an example of one that I sometimes think that it's better to look at one that really doesn't work. Sure. Um, and I think the, the biggest problem, first of all, is again the, the confusion of influencer marketing to, to advertising or looking at followers. If you want something to work, and what he was saying, you know, why is he so successful? Because clearly he, he knows his product, he knows his audience. As a brand or as another influencer wanting to work with somebody, you need to do your homework up front. So when you're talking about aligning brand messaging and uh, making it organic and following, the, the assumption should be, that, and this is why when they say influencer marketing doesn't work, it's not the influencer's fault, usually. It is your fault for not doing your homework up front and then expecting something else. You should be choosing them because of their audience, that's the audience that you want, because of their content, because of their messaging, because of their style of posting. And so when coming in and then get putting too many parameters and scripts on an influencer completely changes. No longer are they authentic. And it's not going to be the type, they know their audience better than anybody, and that should be why you've been choosing them. So um, an example was I, I worked with um, when, when one of the first wireless headphone companies, um, and it, they, wanted, they wanted a running video using the wireless headphones. Uh, well, it was clearly an agency, so I wasn't even dealing with a client. It was just the agent who clearly had not done her research other than fault looking at followers, and I don't think she knew my content at all, and um, she sent me over like a, a one sheet of messaging points, all of which had to be integrated into this like four minute clip. And I read it and thought, this is, and, and this was my mistake too, because I, I was like, oh, this is, a, you know, in the beginning of my career, this is a lot of money, I've got, I should do this. And, but I said, you know, this, I don't think this is gonna work, it sounds very scripted, and I would never normally say these things, it sounds like an infomercial. Nope, this is what the client, this is the messaging from the client, this is what you do. So sure enough, shot the video that way. They came back and said, the client thinks it sounds like an infomercial. It doesn't look anything like your normal content. We need to reshoot it. And then that brings the next point of like why it's so important to develop that relationship. When I worked with um, certain other brands, like I, I, I had a long-term relationship with Zico Coconut Water and I loved them because they built this relationship and I would do anything for them. I did a lot of stuff that was never paid, integrated them into every aspect of my life. Because of the relationship with this, she didn't even have enough time to get on a phone call to go over this campaign. That when she said it's time to reshoot, I said, great, that's another day rate. Mm -hmm. Had it been Zika with a great relationship, I think that the relationship between the brand and the influencer or the influencer and the, whatever it is, it is a relationship business. Mm -hmm. I think the key point in that is that it's the brands adopting the influencer creator's audience and style. You're, they're integrating into their content, not the other way around. So you're not saying, I now represent the brand. It's the brand saying they're integrating with your content. Exactly. And that's a different approach. I think uh, one of the key points I've heard is this idea of alignment and that an agency should approach the selection process not from a follower account because it's really the least valuable metric there, but looking at engagement, looking at audience qualitative metrics So, versus a quantitative number. It's not just the number of followers you have, but who they are, why they follow you, and who you are, and what kind of content you create. Um, any other examples of good or bad campaigns that you've dealt with? Yeah, I think we've talked so much about the brand aligning with the audience. However, there is, like to me, success for a campaign is when 
the brand, um, you know, gets its goals. And that's actually not always audience amplification. For example, I worked with um, a smartwatch company from Denmark, and they were just brand new, and they had no content. And all they needed was content and imagery. Um, and so in order to kind of populate their brand new Instagram feed, instead of hiring out a photographer and a studio, we hired out 50 micro-influencers. They all got sent a $300 smartwatch of their choice, and they could do whatever they wanted with it. There was no content approval. There was no, I mean, there was a campaign page with a mood board, which is really important if you are a brand, um, especially if you haven't worked with influencers before, is providing them that mood board so they can see not only written down what you're looking for, but a visual. But also on my end, I had to like hand pick, you know, um, I think the, the brand approved 100 influencers and we ended up working with 50. But they had to have the exact, it was very minimal, very, uh, Scandinavian like style and so they all had to be photographers it didn't matter how many followers they had it didn't matter their audience breakdown because it was a unisex watch so it was totally all about what their feed looked like and you could just look at their feed and in an instant tell if they would do something cool with this watch so it wasn't really about how many watches were sold um, how many swipe ups people got if people were asking about it. It was all about just getting this brand a ton of beautiful images. And I think we worked with people with 2,000 followers and just gave them the watch. Like it, it, it was scalable um, from 1,000 to, you know, 75,000 followers, whatever, because um, they didn't have that much budget. But to me, that was, I mean, and I've worked with everyone from, the weekend to Rihanna and like something like that to me is just a total win. <laughs> well, I think there's a good point there is know why you're working with the creator. Yeah. Is it, you know, is it to drive visibility? Is it to tell a story? Is it to drive a click through or a sale? Or is it to create, create audience? I'll oh, sorry, create, a, create content. Yeah. And so those are all very specific reasons and you're going to choose different creators for those reasons appropriately. And, and you're right, we've seen brands that have done on one end of the spectrum and on the other. Uh, Megan, can you tell us, you represent a lot of, and you work with a lot of talent. Mm -hmm. um, also, especially in the younger audience, so like a lot of the newer platforms, TikTok, yes. uh, as a great example. That's a very different environment than what everyone knows on Instagram <laughs> on, say, YouTube. So, what are some integrations or some campaigns you've seen there that have, have worked? Uh, yeah, it's definitely a very different type of environment. Kids are a totally different type of audience because they're super engaged and they care so much. Um, but they don't have the spending power that their parents have, uh, which can be tough. So, you know, there's lots of kid influencers with huge followings that don't get a lot of brand deals. Um, and if they do, it's toys or, you know, kid focused type things. Or, like, I worked at ByteDance, which is the company that owns TikTok and uh, Vigo, what used to be Flipagram. And so that's, you know, a challenge that they're facing, honestly, is that. Almost every, everyone on TikTok is a child because it used to be Musical.ly and that was a kid's app. So they're trying frantically to age up their, that demographic because they know that while kids are awesome, they can't spend money. So there's minimal ad revenue going into TikTok right now. That said, there are specific verticals where you definitely, you know, kid influencers are the best. You know, if you you know, kids watch kids, so if you want to promote Disneyland, or, you know, like if you want to promote toys or games or, you know, colorful makeup for kids or something like that, they're the perfect demographic for that, and, you know, their audience will engage very hard, and it's basically, you know, the new commercials between Nickelodeon shows that we used to watch and get all excited about the toys. Now it's just, you know, an unboxing video where Ryan Toy Reviews opens a toy and plays with it. And they'll watch it over and over, which is another important thing that, you know, it's really hammered in. Like, you, you will get a ton of views on that type of content because kids like watching stuff over and over. In that scenario, though, your metric for success is then engagement? Um, almost always my metric for success is engagement. But, um, yes, I would say so, some engagement, but also just awareness because... You know, that's really what matters is that the kid's going to be aware of the product. They're going to see it in Toys R Us or whatever comes after Toys R Us. And then they will, um, and, and they'll pester their parents. Like, the goal, ultimately, in terms of sales, is getting them to pester their parents. So, okay, so top of mind. make it look fun, you know, really make them want it. Okay. Um, 
for the agency side, so maybe uh, Marie, what are the metrics that you look at after a camp? Like when you've engaged someone, you figure out that they're a good match, you said great, you have good engagement, you have the right needs, you have the right audience, campaign goes out, and at the end, what are you looking to show back to your clients? Um, well, every client is different, obviously, if there's, sometimes you have the 70-year-old old white man CEO, like no offense, but who really doesn't understand anything about what they're paying for, and if they can't see the money flowing in from whatever they're doing, they don't want to do it. Um, and then I've also gotten the opportunity to work with amazing brands like Puma, who just totally get it, and it's so, if you say this person's cool, they say, okay, put our shoes on them. Um, so it definitely depends on the brands. Um, I think we always encourage them to not think of influencer marketing as a direct ROI kind of formula because it's just not. There's um, a lot more qualitative like factors we look at. Like um, when we're re doing a report, for example, on a campaign, we also do just ongoing programs. So like success would be if we're continuing to show up in someone's feed organically beyond being what something was paid for. Um, also like on the influencer side, I think people would be surprised to know that the person I choose to work with over and over again might not be the most amazing photo or the highest engaged thing ever. It's, are you a nightmare to work with or not? Mm. Because we are all people and I have to like live my life and it's not gonna be worth it. I don't really care what kind of engagement you got on your YouTube video if your agent was um, uh, not nice. So, <laughs> Like, and it truly is like we're all people and like it's just so important to remember it's we're really not curing cancer and we're not doing brain surgery. We're selling stuff on the internet. So just be nice, um, be responsive and communicative. Honestly, I know this isn't exactly what your question was, but to me that is kind of how I measure success is if I wanna work with them again and if, um, of course, if the brand is happy but it's, it's usually when you have those good working relationships that result in content that a brand will be happy well, with. So it all starts there. It's yeah. a really good point. Like, if there's a positive relationship, when you've seen this with a lot of influencers, if they, if they work well with the brand, uh, their relationship, the communication is great, you get better to be more enthusiastic on both sides of the equation. Um, yeah. What I want to look at, though, is... Uh, actually, uh, Amanda? I was going to give, there's an, in terms of you asked for ROI, I think, it, again, it comes down to your, your goals, right? So if you look, uh, I think we're, we talked, I think there's the words awareness and engagement thrown around, but what does awareness mean? Does impressions mean awareness? I think these are very extremely vague and abstract terms. Engagement, what does that even mean? So I think that's where you have to go back to your goal, and that's how you're going to make the client happy, or, you, or, in the, or um, how um, the client, sorry, if you're the agency, how you, you're gonna, or the brand, you're gonna be happy, or if you're the influencer, how you're gonna make them happy. And it's like, you, you, you need, you would never start a race and not know where the finish line is, yeah. but yet that's what we're doing with influencer marketing. So to say, we just, we're, we're shooting for engagement, and then the campaign's over, well, what, what exactly did we get? And, you know, deciding, are we looking for awareness, or are we looking for conversion, are we looking for sales, and I think setting those metrics. So is this campaign, are we, are, are we doing this partnership to increase newsletter subscriptions? Give us something, something to go, and then she's right, it's a lot of qualitative, it's the human factor, and when it's a long-term relationship, Oftentimes, we don't see all the opportunities that come from a long-term relationship. However, we do see that what was our what was our sales? If that's our goal, sales. What were our sales like before we started working with them? What are our sales like during? And then maybe you want to look at after the campaign, or, or or looking at geographically. Okay, we tried we tried these influencers in this market. If that's if you're a national or global brand, we didn't in this market. How did they compare? It's not an exact science, but there are ways to there are ways to measure. Well, and I think our engagement. There's a. Oh. I just also wanted to say like that transparency up front is so important. So being, you know, talking to a brand and telling them like if you want to do influencer marketing, this is what your cost per view is going to be approximately. If you just want, a, you know, cheap advertising, buy ads on <laughs> on social media. Yeah. You know, you're if you, you know, if that's what you're looking for, just this is a cheaper way of doing it, but if you want that influencer's audience engaged with you and them, 
then influencer marketing is going to be better. And then on the influencer side, transparency is important too. Setting you know, reasonable expectations and communicating the things you want. I can't tell you how many times a brand has changed their mind partway through a campaign mm -hmm. and I have to be the one to tell the influencer, I'm so sorry, you're going to have to reshoot this because they've now decided that they want to go in this direction. Um, it's not conducive to those good relationships that you guys were talking about and so it's something that it's I really... It's not fair either. I mean, I think there's a, there's a level of professionalism on both sides. Um, but also I think there's a level of understanding on both sides, right? That everyone's kind of highlighted, which is like, know why you're doing it, know what you're doing. Um, if you're a creator, know what you create, why you create it, and what the client needs, but also who you are and what your value is and vice versa. Um, uh, can I... Ex yeah. I just want to give an example from an influencer side. Um, over a year ago, we worked with a sponsor who approved a piece of content that we then uploaded. And one of their higher ups saw the content and said, well, hey, there might be some tricky legal stuff here because the way it was integrated, we need the content removed, but go ahead and pay them and just tell them, thank, you know, thank you for your time. Well, I got paid and I was like, okay, but I really like this brand, I really like the sponsor and I really want to work with them. So a few months later, I booked a flight out to New York City, uh, set up a meeting with them, came and sat down with them and said, look, this is how I like to make good on this sponsorship. To me, I don't feel like I deliver what I know I can deliver. I know I can give you the results that would turn this into an exciting long-term relationship. And I would simply like to do a make good video on my behalf to show you what I can do. And they took a step back and they said, you know what, um, we really appreciate that. We want to do another campaign with you and we're going to pay you for the campaign. And now they pay me every month to do a new campaign and it's added up to well over six figures over the past year. Yeah. And I think to her comment earlier, uh, influencers definitely have a little bit of a diva personality, uh, myself included. And you do lose sight of the business aspect when you let that personality take over because I think good business is good healthy mutual, mutual respect and influencers would rather often get paid and just you know move on but to me a good relationship uh, let's say it starts off as a small cheap test campaign is better than no relationship because that can evolve into something bigger and better if you show respect and you show the results and the courtesy and the willingness to make good if, God forbid, the YouTube algorithm changes overnight and your video underperforms. And just, it's so important, like you said something that is so important, which is if you actually really love a brand and want to work with them, tell us. Because so many times people just respond with numbers and, you know, if it's not in the budget, we just move on. And then I've had agents come back to me saying, oh, she really loves this brand and she really, you know, the, the, the campaign filled up and they said she really wanted to work on that. And I said, you never told me your, your client really wanted to work on that. You just gave me a, num a, a price and I'm going to go with the person that if I had known how much you love this brand, maybe I would have, you know, shuffled budgets around for you because that's the goal. I want people that love a brand. I don't want to pay someone that has never heard of a brand before because people can tell, like you said. So it's so important to, if you do love a brand, it doesn't, um, it doesn't give you less bargaining power. It actually, like, gives you more, I think, in my opinion. So it is really important to... Um, let a brand know if there's places where you've talked about them organically, um, show it. If you've been wearing Pumas since you were six, like bust out the family photo album. Like, <laughs> that's what we want. That's the goal of everyone. That it's everyone wants to work like that. Final I match is super critical. Um, and I just, I just think how you represent yourself is super important and how your management represents you. Uh, as an influencer, you never want to come across um, even if you know a brand flat out the first message they send you is an offer with an amount or exactly what the what it's going to be you don't you don't want to you know give them the middle finger you don't want to be rude and you don't want to have a bad relationship with a brand ever because one you never know what a small brand might become and you don't know who is behind that brand and you don't want to ruin any relationship for yourself um, and it just really, it's really important to make sure that, I mean, that's something that I think we've all emphasized here is to just be kind and we're all people and to just keep relationships at a good place. The, the value, I think, I mean, you're working with a creator for their relation with their audience. So the whole thing is about relationships, ultimately. Mm -hmm. I want to um, kind of separate. I think we, we talked about the, the relationship side in depth, which is great. 
I do want to like kind of wrap up on the KPIs and the metrics side because I think that's really important. I think there's one highlight here has been that there's different kinds of KPIs or metrics. There's engagement, there's visibility, there's a, a, a purchase, there's a click through, there's a download. And then you all highlight different versions of that. Um, or there's just awareness in terms of like top of mind. So Zekai, I think there's, there's an analogy to that in the sense that we talk, obviously KPIs are very, like uh, downloads are very explicit, click through, stuff like that. Different formats will fit that. You know, I think someone mentioned an Instagram story mm -hmm. with a swipe up link. If you're looking for like that click through, that's going to be the best way to go about it. If you're looking for maybe awareness and just top of mind musically or uh, sorry, well, TikTok mm -hmm. or, a, or Instagram post where it's, there's not really, a, there's no format for conversion there, but there's a lot of format for engagement and messaging is really key. But okay, I think there's, there's an, you were a host and you do a lot of press junkets and I think when you're looking at measuring engagement and awareness, it's not just like how many people saw the ad, but what were the key things communicated? Um, is there a way, because of your background and your content, that you found you can either measure what you communicate to your audience that relates back to what the brand needed, or has your audience engaged with the content that then echoed some of the key points that you were trying to communicate that you've seen? Like, how do you measure that? Um, so, um, uh, for example, so he mentioned press junkets. So, um, uh, I was interviewing for um, a movie, if you've heard of it, called The Duff, uh, starring Bella Thorne and Mae Whitman. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. Um, basically, um, the studio reached out to my management company, and I had the opportunity to interview the stars of the movie. And I think for the brand, the numbers I had wasn't important but the personality I had was important. Um, they wanted someone who reflected the personality of the stars of the movie um, to, to put this online and, and spread the word that, hey, this movie is coming out. Um, and so during that interview, we just had fun. It was just my personality being me and uh, Bella being Bella and May being May, and we just had a really good time talking to each other, and I think that is what the studio wanted. That is what they wanted to see. They wanted people to see that these are regular people. They're relatable. You got to go check out this movie. It's just going to be a good time. And I think that, if that answers your question. Um, you know, I'm sure also on the content, if you post that content, you would probably get comments from your community that would reflect that. We've seen in campaigns where there's one that comes to mind with Intuit, where uh, it was a fashion influencer. It has nothing to do with taxes, right? But she was someone who was an independent um, business owner, she was an entrepreneur, she did her own taxes, she was self-employed, and so she talked to her audience about how she was trying out this tax product, and the conversation that was, came from that in her comments were, oh, I have that same problem, I use this thing for my taxes, or maybe I should try that. So maybe with the movie example, it might be like, oh yeah, like, I can relate to those moments, they might call their friends to come, and maybe come, oh, because they might tag someone else, we see that a lot. Yeah. In socials, you'll tag your friend. Oh yeah, exactly. It's just, I mean, social media is just constant cross-promotion. That's what it's, that's what your focus is as an influencer, as a brand. You're constantly promoting your, one influencer can mean hundreds. It can just mean, it's, it's limitless, really, if you're doing it right on both ends. I mean, it's a very measurable metric. Let's go back, going back to metrics of success. You can say, great, that one post drove these many conversations or these many positive keys of the key, uh, uh, positive um, instances of our key points mm -hmm. um, from the audience, which means you know that there's a deep value there. Let's, so this talk is really about, um, really about how to make money. We talked about how to set the deal up. We talked about how to run the deal. We talked about how, what the results should be. But let's just get into the dollar amount. How do you price? Tiny Sponsor has a tool that allows you to <laughs> enter your following and it'll give you an example price to, you know, start from at least. Yes, yes, we do give a good media value. So, but, but one thing that we've highlighted in this panel is that it's not just about the media, the advertising value, because um, as Amanda, you said, there's advertising and there's marketing. Mm -hmm. So there's other value that a creator has. Yeah. So how do you price all that? I think going back to the idea of uh, what are they, what are you creating? And she made a good point. There's various different ways to use an influencer. Um, if you're a new brand creating content, how much is that content, thinking about it, these are creators. How much is that content going to cost you? If you were, or how much is that advertising gonna cost you? Um, are you doing a video? Would you need production? Would you need a set? 
Um, if you're doing an ad in a magazine, you need models, you need to cast for it, you need a crew. When you get an influencer, you're, you're getting all of that. How much would that cost? So it's amazing at, at Outreach when she talks about that you know, old CEO that, that doesn't know social media. At first glance, he's gonna say, there's no way we're paying six figures to some social media star that has our audience. However, if you reposition it as, okay, well, we need to, do a, we need to do a video campaign, uh, we need to do six videos, and we need to get a set, and, it, then, we need, and then we need to get an audience, so then we need to drive SEO, and we need to do, get Facebook ads, and we do all this. How much is that gonna cost? Uh, and I think that we start to allocate as producers, as photographers, as all of these things. Um, and then to that point, the brand then gets residual because they can use that content. They might not even want the influencer. They might not even need them to promote it. Like I said, they don't have no, any following. It's not even about the following. If you want great content, brands are all becoming media brands now. They need the content, having them produce it. And then a third way is using influencers as part of your research and R&D uh, product development. So if you have a new uh, line of, Revlon has a new lipstick coming out. Who knows the audience best? The influencer that actually has that audience. So where we have, instead of a bunch of executives sitting in a room trying to figure out what a 17 year old girl is going to want, who is the influencers that that 17 year old girl is following? She should be weighing in. And then that builds the relationship as well because and everybody wants to be asked for their expertise and their opinion and be valued that way. So that builds a relationship with an influencer when you say, hey, we really want you to be a part of this product development. Your opinions really matter. Zach? Yeah, so on the influencer side of things, I dealt with a variety of sponsors ranging from physical products to application technology. And obviously, apps are very easy to measure and to create a, a price behind. Um, but sometimes you can't really figure that out and you kind of have to ask yourself, well, what is the industry standard? And I'm part of Facebook groups and we share notes. And I find that for me as an influencer, my price range is usually between 10 to $50 in terms of CPM. So for every thousand views, 10 to $50. Um, and a lot of times I find that people that I work with are not prepared for me to do guarantee views. They actually are very surprised by that. Um, but that really helps out a lot because then I know for a fact that I have a great piece of content I'm holding, I'm sitting on, that will outperform my promise. And I think that's another thing I like to do is under promise and over deliver because then it opens up their budgets even more. They're like, can you repeat this for us? We want these type of results again. Yes, but in order for me to guarantee that minimum, that new minimum, this is what's going to cost. And they love that, they're down for that. Um, and oftentimes I think uh, marketers and, and sponsors think that, okay, well, one video is all I need. That's it. But I offer the chance to do multi-video campaigns at a discount. And if they're willing to buy in bulk, uh, I make the argument that, look, you know, my audience is young and they're getting hit with a lot of information every day. And Market Rule 7 dictates that the reason you have an ad on a bus or a billboard is not because it's gonna automatically convert somebody, but because it constantly reminds them of something mm -hmm. amongst the noise and the busyness of everything. Um, and that's why I think a multi-video campaign makes sense. And it's always about trying to make sense behind the price and make sure the price doesn't feel like a big risk for them. And then if they can commit to the price, over deliver on that price, and then they open up the budgets more. That's a good point that ultimately, it, it, relationship and qualitative values matter, but it has to make business sense for it to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Where you don't want to burn out a brand and say, oh, we did this thing, yeah, we had, we had this maybe, but it had no value to them, because it, maybe they chose you for the wrong reason, maybe you priced yourself wrong, and then they just, they just say, oh, and filter marketing is not working, which is not true, because it actually outperforms when it's done right. I, I operate on a CPM basis, too, when determining costs, but it's a bit lower for, um, for Instagram photos, for example, maybe it's like starting out between a $5 CPM and an $8 CPM just because it's based on following numbers, which it um, ultimately is going to reach a fraction of that full audience. And then for video content, definitely it's so much more work that uh, we would always um, aim for more like a $10 CPM. Um, so it's actually like really awesome that you do a cost per views 
Um, cost for engagement, of course, is something people talk about as well. Um, like if you uh, get 1% engagement on your sponsored posts, if you have 65,000 followers, then you could probably um, you know, charge $650 per post, so it's like 1% of your audience. I wanna, yeah. I wanna, I wanna, we're running out of time, so I wanna, this is good stuff. <laughs> I wanna break that down though, so there's different types of value in a, in a sponsorship. A sponsorship isn't just views, isn't just content creation, isn't just whatever. Uh, so let's make a little of an equation if we can. So let's say there's a base value, we'll call it the media value. That's gonna be what is the value of your views and it's probably gonna be tempered by the audience that's relevant to the brand, right? So it might be great for one, but it might be bad for another brand. Yeah, and I mean, if you have 2 million followers, that's amazing for you. But if 1.5 million of them are like horny teenage boys because you post in a bikini every second and I'm selling female skincare, I'm, I'm going to pay you yeah. for the 50,000 females following you and you can't really argue with that. So I think every influencer also needs to be upfront about their stats. It's very normal practice these days to... Um, provide your, your YouTube demographics, your Instagram demographics, and that's not something you should balk at showing. Um, for blogs too, like unique monthly views. Um, I just had someone, I just said, asked someone if they could send me their UMVs and they said, what is that? So, <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, just Google it, please. <laughs> on that <laughs> note though, if, if, if you were selling a video game targeting that horny young boys, that might outperform and right. you could possibly charge more. So I think, We'll wrap, up with, <laughs> we'll wrap up with the um, receipts. We'll wrap up with, we're out of time, so I want to wrap up with um, just kind of a, a breakdown of what a pricing could look like. So this is a media value. There's going to be the value of the content creation, which we talked about. There's going to be the value of conversation, engagement, and messaging, like the visibility of all of that. Um, there's also going to be value in conversion, depending on if the format allows it or not. Um, and then and all that will be tempered probably by your audience, by the vertical that you're in, if you're in luxury, you might charge a lot higher CPM equivalent. If you're in fashion, it might be a little bit lower. And so when you're approaching a deal, I think we all agree that, that it is a multifaceted type of deal, but there's really clear guidelines that can be followed as long as you leave flexibility for working with the individual. Is that kind of a good, good summary? Yes, but you missed the key part of be nice to work with. Be nice to work with. <laughs> <laughs> and answer your email. Yeah, responses are if good. If you don't respond, then... Yeah, cool. not going to work with you again. Or, so, or hire someone that will respond. <laughs> thank you so much for being on the panel. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Some of us will be around uh, afterwards in the back for any questions. Thank you.